Our scripture reading today is found in John 12, 44 to 47. And it says, Then Jesus cried out, He who believes in me really is really believing in the one who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world. I come so that whoever believes in me will not stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not obey them, I do not judge him, for I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The sermon that I'm going to be giving is from my friend Brooks Martin. Brooks Martin has stage four or five cancer. I'm not sure which one hospice now. I was at his house last Sunday. I left from Maine to see him, and he's really not in very good him. He just wants to die. So much pain. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. All right, so I informed his wife, because he's not really able to talk on the phone, that I was going to do a sermon today. And she was very happy about that, because he always regretted the fact that he wrote these sermons, and he was only to preach them once. And I said, well, send them to me. I want them. And praise God, I have them. So I get to share one with you today. All right. So let's begin. Um, I did want to say that um, I know I have his blessing, but I was wondering if you could pray with me now before I begin. Oh, Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to share a sermon Mr. Brooks wrote. Dear friend of mine, Lord, and he's definitely a friend of yours. I pray, Lord, that you bless this sermon, that the words will touch the people's hearts, and that above all, they will see their need of you and desire a closer walk. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is a story of God's patient and loving dealing with the rebellious inhabitants of this world. It is a story of paradise lost and a paradise restored and of ultimate sacrifice that was paid by the creator of the universe to achieve that end. The Bible is an accurate record, divinely inspired history of a fallen planet in tension and its people in crisis. This morning, I would like to take a familiar story from one of the dimensional readings, from a one-dimensional reading of the page of visualizing the three-dimensional experience of people immersed and societal and spiritual crisis. The story of Simon's Banquet, and we've entitled it A Dinner to Remember, but he wrote something else which is not as good. The story of Simon's Banquet is recorded in varying detail in all four Gospels and is compiled and presented in chapter 62 of the Desire of Ages. I highly recommend it. It's a chapter, a big Sabbath reading for this afternoon. If you have the book, pull it out, chapter 62 of Desire of Ages. It'll give more light from today's sermon. I wrote on my page, read slowly. He's a smart man, and he uses big words. <laughs> okay, the backstory most often gives meaning and thrust to the event taking place and Simon's banquet, at which Jesus was one of the two guests of honor, is no exception. So here's a thumbnail sketch of the political and religious pressures that were involved in this Saturday evening meal. So it was a Saturday evening. Rome ruled the civilized world with an iron fist. Somewhere along the line, the Roman government had come to the conclusion that rather than slaughtering the people of the conquered nation and destroying their cities, it was more profitable to make them a vassal nation. And a with a puppet, puppet government and allow them to practice their own peculiar religion and then tax the populace of that maximum to the maximum event possible. This approach successfully funded the Roman government and supported its massive army. The traditional religion of Israel was Judaism. Its puppet governing body called the Sanhedrin consisted of two groups who bitterly opposed each other both politically and in religious beliefs. The Sadducees were the minority people. They were wealthy, lordly, skeptical of religion, and were politically motivated. Doesn't that sound like part of our government? Most of the priests and high priests came from this group. 
Sadducees presented a public image of great piety in order to deceive the public. Hmm. They did not believe in angels, the resurrection, or the afterlife. Sadducees believed that God had taken a hands-off position toward humans after creation and that it was up to mankind to shape its own destiny, much like the concept of humanism which prevails in our society today. Pharisees were the majority party. They practiced a strict, evolving interpretation of the Mosaic law. Today, we call it salvation by works. Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They looked for the promised Messiah to emerge as a ruler who would defeat the Romans and establish Israel as the central government of the world, as prophesied by the ancient scriptures. Both of these groups were united in their hatred of Jesus, whose teachings did not mesh with their individual paradigms for life and reality. So much of the politics of the age now for the individuals, so much for the politics of the age. Now for the individuals who were the principal characters at Simon's Banquet, which incidentally was catered by a woman named Go oh, Martha. The host of the banquet was Simon, a prominent Pharisee who lived in Bethany, a small town which was 30-minute walk from Jerusalem. At some unspecified previous time, Jesus had healed Simon of leprosy. Simon was grateful for this and had joined Jesus' followers, thinking that Jesus may have been a prophet, but nothing more. Although grateful for the healing act, there had been no change in Simon's character or his principles. Lazarus of Bethany was also well connected to the upper crust of Jerusalem society. In the presence of both Sadducees and Pharisees, he had been resurrected from the dead by Jesus a few months earlier. At the banquet, he was the center of curiosity by the attendees. Given the opposing beliefs on resurrection held by the Sadducees and Pharisees, Jesus' act and the presence of Lazarus was irrefutable, irrefutable proof that Jesus was indeed the son of God as he claimed to be. Both of these parties had united together on the necessity to murder both Jesus and Lazarus and hide the crime so that their position of influence in the nation could be maintained. For this reason, Jesus had withdrawn into the countryside until the time of the Passover drew near. Mary's actions at the banquet were the factor that precipitated dramatic reactions not only in the attendees, but in the lives of millions since that time. Mary was a sister of Lazarus. There is much disagreement among scholars as to whether she was Mary Magdalene or Mary of Bethany. The SDA Bible commentary and the book Desire of Ages maintain that she was one and the same. At an earlier age, Mary's purity had been compromised by Simon the Pharisee. As a result of this incident, Mary morally went over the proverbial hill. And she may have then moved to the fishing village of Magdala, which was very long distance from Bethany, in order to spare her family the disgrace of her behavior. At some point in time and at some unspecified place, she met Jesus, who sequentially cast seven demons from her body. Mary had accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. She had moved back to Bethany at that time of the story. The love that she had held for her deliverer knew no bounds. Judas is well known to us. He was the treasurer, the one who managed the funds for Jesus and the other 11. Judas was the CPA for the group, and he considered himself to be of higher status than they. Judas was a crook. He presented a pious, frugal front while all the, all the time misappropriating their funds for his personal business ventures. We're not told whether he was, a, was seated at the banquet table or was among a curious group of onlookers, but he was a major player in the action that ensued. Now for the events that took place at the banquet. In your mind's eye, envision three men lying on the floor looking like spokes on a wheel, left elbows resting on a low table and feet projecting into the room. Simon, the former leper, was in the middle, Jesus on one side of him and Lazarus on the other side. The others presented in the room included the disciples of Jesus, 
Some people curious to see Lazarus and many who hated both Jesus and Lazarus were waiting for the opportunity to kill them both. Remember the timing. This banquet took place on Saturday evening, six days before the Passover. The next morning, the first day of the week, Jesus would make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On Friday, Passover day of that year, he would be the perfect sacrificial lamb to fulfill the ceremony of the Passover. The meal had scarcely begun when an overpowering fragrant odor, odor filled the room. A woman was kneeling at the feet of Jesus, weeping profusely while kissing his feet and wiping them with her long hair. This was Mary, and she was confused by the radical change in events. At the resurrection of her brother, Mary had heard Jesus speak of his soon coming death, a great, at great personal expense equivalent to a year's wages for her labor. She had purchased a small vial of spikenard perfume with which to anoint his body. Now, in the last few days, she had heard rumors of Jesus' imminent coronation as the King of Israel, the Messiah. In deep gratitude to her Savior and Lord, Mary proposed to honor him in death or in life. Her bizarre actions and the overpowering odor of the perfume focused all attention on her and Jesus. Judas was the first to react to Mary's behavior, whispering to the other disciples. He said that the cost of her outrageous purchase might have been better given to him so that the poor could be provided for. The disciples bought into this farce and soon all the guests picked up on it and united in criticizing Mary. She was about to slink out of the room in humiliation when she heard Jesus' compassionate voice say to the guests, let her alone. Why are you troubling her? Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be spoken of as a memorial to her. When all this commotion had first begun, Simon had thought to himself, oh, this man, Jesus, were truly a prophet. Wouldn't he know who and what type of woman this is who is touching him? For she is a sinner. Jesus read Simon's mind and used the same technique of t initiating self-condemnation that Nathan had used on David when confronting him with his sin against Bathsheba. In posing the parable of the two forgiven debtors and eliciting Simon's self-judgment of guilt, Simon realized that Jesus was indeed more than a prophet. So, this is church. If you have a Bible, pull it out, please. And let's turn to, John, to Luke chapter 7. And we're going to read 40 through 47. That. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say on. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Simon got the point. He realized the magnitude of his sin against Mary. At that moment, Simon accepted Jesus as his savior and became a devoted, active disciple. Jesus also perceived the treachery of Judas, but chose not to openly address it. For to do so would have elicited more rebellion and self-justification in Judas's heart. The look that Jesus gave Judas convinced him that Jesus understood the hypocrisy of his heart and saw the base 
contemptible character that motivated him. Judas determined to be revenged for his silent rebuke and went out to strike a deal with the high priest. For a sum far less than the box of anointment costs. We all know the sad ending of the life of Judas. At any point, Jesus would have been willing to forgive Judas of his contemptible life had he come to the Savior in true condition. Contrition. When Judas expressed remorse before the priest for his act of betraying Jesus, he did not repent for his sins. He died at his own hands, a lost man. Little is known about the occupation or temp per temperament of Lazarus of Bethany, other than that he was a dear and trusted friend of Jesus. He is not mentioned again in the Bible after Simon's banquet. Today, there is a mosque built over the alleged site of his final resting place near the village of Bethany. Mary Magdalene is the most mentioned female in the New Testament. At the banquet, guided by the Holy Spirit, she anointed Jesus for his burial. She stood near his cross and accompanied his body to the tomb. Mary was the first to arrive at the empty tomb on Sunday morning and the first to greet her risen Lord. She was commissioned by Jesus to summon his departed dispirited disciples. Mary then disappears from the Bible record. Tradition says that she relocated to Ephesus where she died a natural death. Simon the leper disappears from the pages of the Bible after the banquet night. His story ends when he realizes his sinfulness and surrenders himself to Jesus. I will end our story today by quoting from the closing paragraphs of Simon's banquet taken from the pages of the Desire of Ages. Jesus knows the circumstances of every soul. You may say, I am sinful, very sinful, and you may be. But the worse you are, the more you need Jesus. He turns no weeping contrite one away. He does not tell to any all that he might reveal, but he bids every trembling soul take courage. Freely will he pardon all who come to him for forgiveness and restoration. The souls that turn to him for refuge, Jesus lifts above the accusing and the strife of tongues. No man or evil angel can impeach these words. Christ unites them to his own divine human nature. They stand beside the great sin bearer in the light proceeding from the throne of God. My friends, Christ died in order to make intercession for us before the throne of God. My prayer is that each one of us at the beginning of every day will seek the pardon and forgiveness that he offers and then go about our duties clad in his righteousness. And our closing hymn is 248. Oh, how I love Jesus. Father in heaven, Truly indeed, we are all sinners. Such a great, mighty, powerful, and loving God. I want us all to be with you, Lord. And you did the ultimate so that we can. Thank you for your forgiveness of sins, Lord. I thank you for your pardon and your grace that you give so abundantly and freely to all who come to you and ask for it, Lord. Mighty and powerful and wonderful you are, Lord, and I am so grateful that you have done that for us. I pray, Lord, that each one of us today will recommit our lives to you, that we may become closer, more steadfast, and ready for you when you come, for the time is definitely short. Things are pressing on, and you are ready to come. May we be ready for that event, Father. Thank you for all that you do. And I pray in Jesus' name.